So the first speaker is Professor John Sifakis. He's a full professor at the Ecole Polytechnique in Lausanne, a CNRS researcher and the founder of Verimag Laboratory in Grenoble, France. He will address the central questions of how and to what extent strengthening research, technology, and innovation can help Greece develop a sustainable economy and overcome the crisis. He will focus on the experience over the past 40 years regarding the integration of centers of excellence, high-tech startups, and big companies, and, of, and on how these have contributed to growth of developed and developing economies. And then he will outline a set of reform proposals that are necessary if Greece is to experience innovation-driven development and economic recovery. So, Professor Sifakis. Uh, uh, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. It's a great pleasure to be here and talk uh, about innovation. And I would like to especially thank the organizers for giving me the opportunity to express my ideas and vision from this podium. So I know that uh, we don't have, time is short, and I have to go through, uh, very quickly through my slides. Okay, let's see if it works, yes. Okay, so uh, I think that there is an increasing awareness that the exit from the crisis and uh, the development of a modern and competitive economy will require uh, technology and innovation. This is clear. Nobody expects that the solution to the crisis uh, will come uh, through tourism, agriculture, maritime revenues, and the exploitation of natural resources. So there is a common understanding of the problem, and the question is, the important question is, what are the prerequisites for innovation and development? And I would like to say that when I discuss with officials in Greece, I have the impression we are not talking about the same thing. We don't understand the problem in the same manner, unfortunately. So I think a very important question is how we can develop an effective national strategy for innovation. And uh, uh, I think this strategy should be two-pronged. Uh, should build on the country's assets, of course, and it should also strive to implement the necessary structural reforms and changes. Uh, also, I think that it should be clear that such a strategy cannot be achieved uh, through wishful thinking, legislation, decrees, and laws. Uh, we should first understand in depth the problem of innovation in all its dimensions, and we should establish clearly a roadmap with priorities, milestones, and a program that uh, specifies the roles of the key players and or orchestrates these roles so that we achieve the common objective. So in my talk today, I will discuss this problem, and in particular two issues. One. I will try to explain very quickly which historical conditions and processes uh, made innovation the engine of modern economies. And the second is how we can learn from the examples of other countries and how we can mold such a strategy. Now, to talk about the changes and trends in the R&D world that happened after uh, World War II. Uh, after uh, World War II, we had a clear separation between academic research and corporate R&D research. And this changed uh, end of the 80s, beginning of the 90s. Uh, so the idea was that uh, academic research was focused on uh, basic research mainly and corporate R&D had to cover all the needs of big companies from uh, basic research uh, to apply the research uh, and, and, and commercialization. And probably you know uh, the examples of Bell Labs, Xerox Park, IBM Yorktown. Uh, these were huge labs. Uh, that were covering all the spectrum of research. Bell Labs was a kind of mecca of uh, research uh, 
20 or 30 years ago, ago and uh, this model unfortunately collapsed. And uh, here I explain the reasons. Uh, Long-term research has become a luxury for even for uh, uh, great monopolies. And the reason is that uh, modern technology firms are much less vertically integrated. We have the advent of venture capital and we have the advent of centers of excellence I'm going to talk right now. And also, uh, it's important to notice that the boundary between research and development is blurring. The distance between basic research, applied research, and application is, is, is diminishing. Okay, so uh, what I, I, this slide explains is that this division of work that existed between academic research and corporate R&D disappeared sometime in the 80s, and you have the creation of centers of excellence, where center of excellence is the result of collaboration between academic research, industrial research, and centers of excellence so carry out R&D that is generic, and the purpose is to save costs and the risks and they produce IPs, they produce reusable technology that can be specialized by uh, industrial companies and can be integrated in, in the products. So this convergence led to the emergence of uh, innovation ecosystems, and I am going to explain how innovation ecosystems emerged as the convergence of three main players, centers of excellence that bring skill, knowledge, prototypes, large companies that bring money, new problems, some know-how, and of course, startups. So you have the convergence of these three players that creates an, an innovation ecosystem that is characterized by creative culture, human capital, very skilled creative human capital, and of course, quality of life. We don't establish uh, innovation ecosystems in Alaska, okay? We set them in places where it's uh, uh, good to live. And of course, these uh, innovation ecosystems uh, have been created uh, uh, with uh, government support, and, and uh, this, this has been very, very important to have the adequate, uh, say, tax policy, IP, protection uh, laws, public infrastructure, and all this. And of course, uh, uh, capital played an important role. And the outcome of these centers is uh, high-tech uh, products and services that target domestic and global market. Okay, so what we observe is uh, the uh, emergence of this, uh, what I call a virtuous innovation cycle, that uh, is a self-sustained uh, uh, cycle and is based on the tight collaboration between basic research, applied research, and technological research. And uh, here I would like to uh, talk about my uh, personal success story uh, that illustrates uh, very well this idea. In the 80s, uh, we had developed uh, some cutting edge uh, results on verification of software systems, and at the same time Airbus uh, were envisioning the use of uh, fly-by-wire technology by uh, changing the uh, 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 aircraft control system from manual to computerized. And the challenge was to uh, get it certified, so to pre prove to certification authorities that, that uh, this system is, uh, has no flaws and this was a very successful operation. We had three partners, a startup, my laboratory, and Airbus. And uh, this uh, gave Airbus a competitive advantage uh, of uh, more than 10 years over, over uh, competitors. Is time out? My time out already? No. Okay. Uh, so uh, let's... Uh, 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 discuss a bit on what we can learn from others. Uh, first of all, I would like to emphasize that innovation is a, a continuous and lengthy process, and it's uh, the result of a successful mixture between different factors that uh, should cooperate uh, harmoniously, this you understand. And I think the very good news for us is that there is no unique model. Uh, innovation champions can be 
superpowers can be uh, uh, giants, economic giants, but can be also very small countries. And this is of particular interest to us. Here you see a list of countries, I'm not exhaustive, and their strong points, their sectors of excellence. I would like, okay, uh, I would like to say here that small countries are very, very successful. And uh, you see uh, Israel, Switzerland, for instance, is the world's most innovative country. And uh, I think that our, uh, the innovation cause in Greece is not hopeless because uh, small countries can make it. Now, human factors are very, very important. And uh, here there is a lot to say. Uh, just to summarize the idea, I think that uh, Greek development policies have completely overlooked human factors. And uh, economic uh, policies focus mainly on economic measures, and economic measures do not suffice. I think that uh, we cannot uh, compensate lack of uh, human factors with uh, goods, with economic goods. Okay? And it's very, very important that we fight corruption, establish meritocracy. Uh, elites are very, very important and support creative individual initiative. Now, Another thing that is, should be urgently done in, in Greece is that we have to uh, modernize the research system by working in two directions, gathering critical mass and building excellence. A critical mass is very important. Today, uh, the research landscape in, in Greece is fragmented, and we need critical mass to create sophisticated products and to invent technology. Building excellence also is very, very important. To have very good researchers, and the situation in Greece is apparently is clearly not good because we are offering poor salaries. Uh, good researchers do not have recognition. You have a lot of bureaucracy and things like that. So, okay, just to finish, I thought I had more time than that. You have more time. I have. No, no, but you said five minutes. Okay, Lloyd. Okay. So I think that it's very, very important to uh, focus on excellence and restructure research uh, by setting up uh, centers of excellence or whatever we call them uh, on a regional basis with a unified governance and strong governance. And this is missing. Okay, so let me uh, take now a more general perspective and uh, say what we should be done in Greece. We should work in three directions. Reform the research and education system. This I have explained. Uh, I think it's important that we have the instruments for monitoring and evaluating research and we should create a kind of NSF. It's a pity, I'm, I've been repeating it for years, that the Secretariat for Research and Technology is still under the Ministry of Education. It's a scandal because in any developed country, this is, this is the object, research and technology is the object of a separate independent ministry. Also, I think that it's important to uh, create technologically literate workforce. Here again, I would like to say that beginning of August has been published a project of law for reforms in high school, and uh, this, uh, uh, there was a proposal to reduce the number of teaching hours of informatics. Fortunately, they have withdrawn it, but this is a sign that decision makers do not understand really what are the stakes. Now, you can say a lot about industry and, and business. Everybody knows that industrial companies are government subsidized, are introverted, and we would like to have companies that are competitive internationally and innovation driven. And also I think it's very important that the government 
creates demand for research, especially for sectors that are of national relevance. And here, at least two sectors are very, very important, defense and health applications. And finally, for investment and funding, I would like to say that the, the crisis is uh, really an opportunity because we have cheap and qualified workforce and quality of life. So we are, in principle, very attractive for investors. But I think, and when I discuss with investors, they clearly say it, that they will not invest if they don't have guarantees of seriousness, if they don't ha have uh, guarantees of proper functioning of the administration and of the market. So now I conclude. So just to wrap up, I would like to say that the crisis is really an opportunity. It's a good thing that there is a lot of awareness about the importance of innovation, but this is not enough. The distance between the reality and the innovation dream is huge. Okay? As, as I told you, when I discuss with uh, official people, I have the impression that we don't talk about the same thing. Uh, so it's an opportunity. In Greek we say, keri umeneti, which means that opportunities do not wait. Okay? So we should not hesitate. We should not discuss too much. We should act. And I think that... The best way to predict the future is to invent it. There, is, there are a lot to be done, and the toughest battles are still in front of us. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much.